These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. Here comes your guardian policeman. How can you be certain that all of the people killed pose an imminent threat to the United States? There's no doubt that civilians were killed that shouldn't have been. In your life, you will interact with many different social institutions. There is one institution that is unlike any other, one where you are subservient to others. From the cradle to the grave, you will be regulated, taxed, controlled, indoctrinated, coerced, judged, and possibly killed at the whims of members of this organization. This institution is called the state. Well, if we're talking about human history in the largest sense of the word, that is to say, Homo sapiens has been around for 200,000 years. The state was invented only, even at the, at the most charitable estimate, um, 8,000 years ago. And then it only touched a small portion of, uh, of mankind. So the fact is that um, most of human history has been a history of statelessness. If you ask yourself um, how long people have been ruled by states uh, on a on a sort of massive level, um, I ask myself, at what point in history do you imagine that more than half of mankind would have experienced regular tax collection, right, once a year or something uh, like that? There might be plunder from time to time, right? But uh, irregular, episodic, uh, and the existence of a state in most people's life did not come into being for more than half of mankind until around 1600. If we take the history of mankind as a day, the state comes into being at about 1130 at night, right? Um, and it becomes hegemonic at sort of 1140, right? 1145 or 1150. Uh, and the, the thing that qualifies this, of course, is that there's a whole lot fewer Homo sapiens around in these early days. Even Western cities until maybe 1800, 1850, never reproduced themselves by their internal population. That is to say, they were so deadly because of, of typhoid and uh, disease and epidemics and so on, that they uh, they killed more people than they that, that is their population could not grow internally, that all of these cities grew by bringing in more people from the countryside because they had high rates of mortality. The reason the state form has proven so durable, and virtually universal, is that it takes a state to be a state. Um, and so if you think of the early states, um, that is, uh, the early states were all founded in floodplains where you had um, concentrated agriculture and could concentrate a large population. And that's why they tended to be units that were more powerful militarily than a scattered and fragmented countryside uh, around them. And in fact, they grew by plundering that population, by enclosing that population, of bringing it in, uh, having them plant grain, um, and capturing people. So I try to show in, in Against the Grain um, that most of the wars of these early states were wars of capture in order to grab populations. This is true for the Athenians as well. Grab population, bring them in, have them produce for the center or work in the quarries. Kingdoms expanded into empires. Dominant kingdoms expanded by conquest, suppressing people in new territories. 
a hierarchy of governors managed the increasing complexity of empires. A new system appeared in which power was given to the people in the form of votes. Democracy diluted the absolute power of authorities, but introduced demagogues and the tyranny of the majority. Civilization expanded. More decision-making power was delegated. Some political power became subordinated to laws, but delegating power, especially military power, risked a return to empire. Combining features of a democracy with a republic, nations set up basic rights subordinating more political power to the rule of law. Over time, however, special interests found a way to use politics to their advantage. Within a state, I think it's fair to say that you have got the standard uh, aspects of what we all associate with the state, which is tax collection, uh, a system of um, centralized punishment and centralized monopoly over violence uh, so that executions that are legal executions can only be uh, conducted by, by the state. What's important to sort of recognize is that until starting perhaps with the French Revolution, in which, which was an emancipatory, emancipatory movement and the idea that people in all of France were governed by the same law, no matter who they were uh, everywhere in France, that there were no serfs anymore. You were not under the personal lordship of an aristocrat uh, or, or of, the, of the priestly control. Uh, the, the, the French Revolution marks that point in which the state comes to see as its, one of its goals the collective welfare of the people. Notice that the French Revolution did two things. It also made all Frenchmen equal in theory. It took a long time for that to come into practice, especially for women. Um, but um, it also made everyone directly ruled by the state. As populations increased, states grew more sophisticated, controlling not just law, taxation, and the military, but eventually education, social services, central banking, and much of the economy. Laws inform citizens what rules the state has decided they will obey. What began as a codification of norms became a way for special interests to control others. The Protestant Reformation made people, the idea is that everyone can interpret the Bible on their own. So they start thinking of decree, moral decrees from God, and now legal decrees from the state as what's written down on paper and issued by a sovereign. This is the statist way of thinking, and it's not what law used to be until the modern revolution of the modern concept of the state, which is only about two or 300 years old, like the Westphalian um, concept of the state. So Madison is probably the pivotal person in American history as the scrivener of the Constitution, as the chair of the House of Representatives Committee that uh, drafted the Bill of Rights. He believed, we know this from what he said in his retirement, that he gave us a uh, government um, which was liberty of individuals granting power. It wasn't like great in Europe where power, kings, reluctantly granted liberty. So in Madison's view, the American system was the inversion of the European view. Unlike all the strictures imposed on us by states, states themselves are chaotic. States aren't required to follow any rules. There's no rule of law. That's a mythology that we cling to. Um, states can do what they want and they are the judge of their own actions. They're the judge of their own criminality. They're the judge of their own civil penalties. I mean, this is a, a bizarre state of affairs where, where maybe 1% of the population, 3 million or so federal employees, uh, get to dictate to the other uh, 329 million of us how things are going to be. And they're the sole arbiter of their own actions. Um, this, to me, is chaotic. State education produces people who believe in and perpetuate the state's preferred way of thinking. The, uh, the origins of the American education system start in the 19th century with reformers, so-called moral reformers, people like Horace Mann and others, who uh, went to Prussia and found a system of education there that they wanted to emulate in the United States, which they did, and they brought it back here. And they established the modern public schooling system. 
and the idea of a modern industrial capitalist curriculum. And they explicitly stated at the time, these reformers who established the schools in the 1830s and 1840s and 1850s, they said at the time that what we need is to create citizens with these schools, which meant people who knew how to work under industrial, under, under industrial capitalism in a factory, and soldiers, people who were willing to fight and die for the country. So they needed to instill in people a regimentation the idea that people can be made, can and should be made into machines, functionaries for a new civilization, a new modern civilization, where there were large factories and large armies. So the school system was designed purposely that way, and that's why we have the bell system, where the students move from class to class through the day, just like on an assembly line, and they're filled with one piece of information here, and then filled with another piece of information there. So they become both products of the assembly line, and they become the managers of the assembly line, ideally. It's compulsory and universal, the education system. So you are obligated by law to send your child to a school that is approved of by the state. Now it can be your own school, but it has to be approved by the state. Most of us don't have that luxury for various reasons, and especially poor people and working class people. So they have to send their kids, most of them, to government run schools uh, where they are obligated to stay by law from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., no matter what. And if they leave, they are truants, they become criminals, and their parents are liable to arrest and prosecution and imprisonment. And the job of the teachers, sure, is to educate them with whatever the state deems to be a proper education, but it's also to keep them in those seats and in those rooms and in those buildings. If the kid decides to get up and be a free human being and leave that building, the teacher is the first person to tell him to stop, and the first person to call security to force him to stay. That's prison. It's a day prison. It's a minimum security prison, but it's a prison. If I don't send my son to that school, I go to prison or I can go to prison. He, if he leaves the school, plays hooky, he will probably get picked up by the police, detained, labeled a truant, and then brought back to the prison. Services offered by government are not based on voluntary contract. The state expropriates its subject's wealth by compulsory taxation. Uh, so why are they taxing us at all? That, that's a good question. I think it goes back to the idea of taxes as a tool of compliance and terror. A budget is you planning ahead, and taxes is a method of procuring funds. So a budget means I sat down, I thought out my enterprise, it accounts for about this much, this is what I need over this period of time to account for my for operations. When you have a method of procuring your budget by just yanking more, you get to use ignorant excuses like, well, we, we were, not, we're not succeeding, so we need more money. That's not a correlation. Maybe these people are incompetent and they're squandering your money for, you know, it kind of, it doesn't make sense when you start breaking all the things down. Uh, the corporations don't pay taxes, uh, business entities don't pay taxes, only, only people pay taxes because a tax is, is, a, is a burden. It's, it's something that we bear almost in a physical, visceral sense. It's a way to, uh, to ensure that Americans are docile and that Americans are frightened of their government because that's the number one interaction most people have with the federal government is their annual tax form. The amount of tax revenue that government takes in doesn't cover everything it spends. And so to make up the difference, obviously they sell treasury debt. So, uh, you know, as, as bizarre as it sounds, if a, if a portion of the federal government's budget can be funded by debt, arguably the whole thing could be. We could have no income taxes and the four trillion dollars that the US Fed Gov spends every year could, could be uh, financed via, via treasury debt and then ultimately monetized by the Fed. Central banks have significant control over the economies they govern. The Federal Reserve, the central bank of the United States, determines interest rates, controls the money supply, picks winners and losers, and enables nearly limitless government spending increase in my supply, keeping the interest rates low. It turns out that is very beneficial for the federal government. The federal government, whenever they spend more than they take in in tax revenues, they have to borrow. And just like anybody else has to borrow, we have to go to the credit markets and we have to borrow at the prevailing interest rate. Well, when the federal government 
who has the ability to tax, they already get a lower interest rate uh, than the rest of us. They're able to borrow more when already the servicing on the debt, the interest payments on the debt, are already one of our biggest expenses. Um, with the debt that's, what is it now, $23 trillion. Uh, with that kind of debt, anybody else's credit would have run out a long time ago. They are able to keep on doing this because the interest rates are low. So the, the Fed's role in allowing the government to overspend on all kinds of things, but the biggest one would be military, on these wars, endless wars, they're able to keep doing that because they're just able to borrow at lower rates. Absolute monarchs, um, when they got into wars, uh, sometimes they'd run out of money. The treasury would run dry, so armies could not be paid, and they would stop battling in the field and go back. Wars are extremely expensive. Had Americans been forced to pay by taxation, for the Vietnam War, it would have stopped a lot sooner than it, than it did. America could simply print money and buy the things it needed to, 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 to fight the war without having to raise taxes. So it's because it spares people from having to, to pay a visible a price for the war that the war can go on. State military conflicts destroy human lives, pollute the environment, impoverish millions of people, and waste scarce resources in pursuit of state political goals. Regardless of whether they admit it or not, through all sources, about a trillion dollars goes to the so-called defense budget. Now that not only includes the six or seven hundred billion to DOD, but also State Department, a lot of U.S. aid, a lot of other things uh, in the federal budget are, are really defense spending ma masquerading as something else. Well, government's too big and we need to cut spending. If they're not talking about defense, if they're not talking about entitlements, they're not being serious. There, there's no amount of cutting we could do in any other part of the government that would make a meaningful difference. As, as Randolph Bourne famously put it, war is the health of the state, right? The state benefits in lots of ways, directly and indirectly, from war. I mean, everybody remembers Orwell's 1984 and the idea that war was so endemic that you didn't even know who the current enemy was and they kept switching it around, right? So people didn't care. They just knew that they were constantly in a state of warfare, which of course, uh, you know, allows the state to justify a lot of infringements on personal and community liberty that we would normally not tolerate, right? Oh, well, we're in a time of war, so we have to read your emails and we have to spy on uh, what you're doing and make sure that the enemy isn't, hasn't infiltrated you know, our midst. The reason that most people go along with that, albeit you know, with, some, with some grumbling, is because they have been told, we're at war. We're at war with terrorists who would want to blow up airplanes and want to hurt you, and et cetera. So you've got to sacrifice some of your liberty for the security that we, the government, offers. Well, this, uh, this is an example of the, the U.S. government creating problems that it has the appearance then of solving. Uh, we created a problem in Libya with our foreign policy of regime change, of the Gaddafi regime. When we did unleash hell on the people of Libya, uh, chaos broke out as could be expected as could be predicted as we predicted uh, and that also then, then then that in turn requires more intervention because you had uh, you had jihadists uh, moving into Chad and Niger and elsewhere so you had to create more intervention to solve the problems that your your intervention creates but the US uses jihadists they use extremists as cat paws they use it in Syria they use the most violent Islamist extremists in Syria, places like Syria, to overthrow a completely secular regime, a uh, government, uh, and, and, and we saw how many hundreds of thousands have died. Uh, the global war on terror uh, is ramped up and ramped down uh, on Washington's, uh, on Washington's uh, 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 as Washington needs new enemies or doesn't need new enemies. It's, 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 it's in the very, in the, in the most, it's fabricated in the very least. It's something that's created by our foreign policy. It's the same thing from the Reagan years, the Clinton years, and really some during H.W. Uh, Bush, but especially during the Bill Clinton years. And then again, during Bush and Obama, America uses these jihadi, Saudi-backed, Sunni, suicide bomber terrorists for American imperial ends. 
Our government hates their adversaries more than they hate our blood enemies who have slaughtered Americans by the thousands and American soldiers by the thousands in Iraq War II as well. This is how crazy their priorities are compared to what the American people believe they were giving them the writ to do to protect us from these terrorist groups. And of course, Obama's support for Al-Qaeda in Syria led to the rise of the Islamic State. In 2013, they conquered all of eastern Syria. In 2014, they rolled into all of western Iraq, all of Iraqi Sunni stand. And the Islamo-fascist caliphate that had been bin Laden's wildest dream from the attic he was hiding in and had been George Bush's most phony propaganda from the era of his terror war in Iraq had become true. Bush opened up Western Iraq and then Obama backed them to the hilt in Syria to such a degree they were able to erase the Sykes-Picot border between Syria and Iraq and declare a brand new Islamist caliphate. And they had seized a territory the size of Great Britain, which they held for three years before America had then, guess what, of course, had to ally with the Shia in Iraq, the Bada Brigade, the Iraqi Shiite army, and all of those Iranian-backed militias. America flew as their air force. The same guys our government wished they hadn't fought for in Iraq War II, they ended up fighting for them again in Iraq War III. And even now, our special operations forces are embedded with these, well, certainly the Iraqi army, but essentially one degree away from these very same Shiite militias, the ones that Donald Rumsfeld had used back in 2005 when he called it the El Salvador option, his death squads to hunt down the Sunnis. We're playing that same game right now. And so America is on both sides of this terror war all over the region. Same kind of thing is going on in Yemen. The war in Yemen is against an uh, Iranian-backed group called the Houthis who have taken over the capital city. And it has put the USA with our Saudi and UAE allies, again, directly on the side of Al-Qaeda, flying as their air force against their primary enemies, the Houthis. And even the AP and CNN have reported about Al-Qaeda embedded with UAE forces driving American MRAP IED resistant vehicles and participating in the slaughter of civilians in that war. Again, with America flying as Al Qaeda's air force against an enemy that is has a friendly relationship with Iran. Not that Iran attacked us. At this point, it seems like through the Clinton, Bush, Obama, and now into the Trump governments to see that this bait and switch continues on should mean to the American people, to any of us, libertarians or anyone else, that this government is not fit to be our security force. Our security is not its priority. Democide is when a government kills its own people. In the 20th century, it's been estimated 256 million people were killed by their own government. That's six times greater than the amount who died in wars government and uh, the military, the U.S. military uh, and other militaries uh, around the world, but primarily uh, we want to look at communist countries and, and, or socialist countries who killed uh, vast numbers of their own populations. I think that's the greatest indictment against socialism and communism uh, is that the, the Soviet Union killed uh, millions of its own people, starved them to death with famine. Uh, they did the same thing in Red China, where tens and tens of millions of, of their own citizens were killed off. Uh, and so government, particularly when you see uh, where the level of government is highest, and that's in socialism and communism in particular. Cambodia is another example where a high percentage of uh, the Khmer Rouge uh, regime killed off uh, millions of Cambodians. So the biggest problem in the world in, in terms of modern history has been communist dictators killing off their own citizens. Numerous arguments have been used in attempts to justify the state's authority. For a time, it was the divine right of kings. 
More modern justifications argue the state's authority comes from the consent of its people, often referred to as the social contract. There are basically three, three versions of social contract. There's like a, the explicit contract theory, the implicit contract theory, and the hypothetical contract theory. But the explicit contract theory might sound like a straw man, but it's not. So it's a theory that some people actually literally got together and said to each other, hey, let's establish a government. Like they literally explicitly agreed with each other, either writing it down or saying it in words. Um, that might sound like a straw man, nobody thinks that that really happened, but actually John Locke thought that that happened. <laughs> so he thought that with all of the cities, there was a time like when a, when a city was first founded, there was a time when the founders got together and uh, explicitly agreed that they were going to set up a government for their city. Okay, um, and then, so it was explicit for the first generation, then according to Locke, it's only implicit for the later generations, okay, because he's not totally stupid. But the explicit contract theory, um, you know, that's basically not true. So the, like the governments that control, um, that control, you know, the land existing today, um, almost all of them got it by conquest or usurpation. Uh, this is discussed in David Hume's famous essay of the original contract. Um, so conquest meaning like oh, a bunch of people sail from Europe over to this place that we're in now and they just kick the shit out of the people who are living there and take the land. And that's how we have control of the land. Okay. Uh, usurpation is where, you know, there's a government and then somebody just like takes over the government by force. Like right? there's a military coup, they set up a new government. The hypothetical contract theory is a theory that, well, people would agree to set up a government. This didn't actually happen because like you weren't actually given a choice and there was already a government when you were born. But uh, if somebody asked you and if you were rational, you would have agreed to have a government, right? And then, so that makes it okay to impose a government on you. Okay, now there are some cases where um, a hypothetical agreement is valid. Uh, namely, it's valid if it's impossible to actually ask the person and uh, you have good reason to believe that they would in fact consent based upon their actual beliefs and values. So um, there's an accident victim who's been brought into the hospital and they're unconscious and you, you need consent to operate on them but the person's unconscious. The doctors go ahead anyway and the argument is well look almost certainly this person would consent to be operated on because almost everyone values their life and <laughs> etc. But it doesn't work if, first of all, you can ask the person and you just don't want to because you're afraid they're going to say no. Okay, so then you cannot appeal to hypothetical consent. Secondly, uh, it doesn't work if you say, well, they would consent if they had different philosophical beliefs from their actual beliefs. So no, you can't do that, right? So, and that, that would be required for the hypothetical consent to the government um, because there are actual people, they're called anarchists, who we know would not consent. Okay, but that's not generally legitimate. So like if you have a patient who you know they wouldn't consent to be operated on, because like they've said that many times when they were conscious, you can't say, oh, they would consent. Um, also, if you have the patient and they're perfectly conscious and you just don't want to ask them, like that's not legitimate. You can't say, I don't want to ask the patient because I'm afraid he might say no. So I'm just going to argue that he probably would say yes, or we're, we're just going to like gas him and then... <laughs> Do the operation you can't do that right okay that's like the situation with the government why is the government not like they could ask us they could like the irs when they send out your tax return they could have a question on it that says do you agree to the federal government of the united states and then if you say no then you could get a full refund of your taxes i wonder why they're not doing that and it's not because they already know everyone would agree it's because they know too many people would not agree and then they would have to give back the money and they don't want to give it back. So when a young person reaches an age of, of consciousness uh, where they might be able to uh, reasonably think about and read about the nature of government for themselves, uh, their friendly local city councilman or congressman or, who, or governor or whomever doesn't come over and say, well, hello, young citizen X, pleased to meet you. Uh, I'd like to offer you my governmental services, which will include road and police and fire and courts and, and, and uh, colleges and all kinds of wonderful things. And in exchange, 
uh, here, here are some contract terms. If, if you sign this, you're, you know, you agree, let's say at the state level to pay an 8% annual income tax, and there'll be some sales and property taxes along with it, but you know, it's all gonna work out swimmingly for you, and you're really gonna like this. And so this, this young person takes a look at it and says, well, you know, uh, that's interesting. I, you know, I, I appreciate this and you haven't stuck a gun in my face, at least yet, but I, I'd like to shop around a bit. Well, well, well hold on a minute. It, it turns out there is no shopping around. It turns out that this uh, contract being offered to you is kind of one-sided. Uh, we have a, mon a monopoly provider. Uh, uh, for these services. And it turns out that the price you're going to pay for these services can be changed almost at will by the service provider himself and, and his cronies in the uh, legislature. So all this would be a very odd uh, form of contract uh, for, for most people. And then if it turns out that e even, even when you couldn't shop around, you couldn't even say no. In other words, if this young person said, I'm going to go live out in the woods by myself and I'm not going to use your roads and I'm not going to use your schools, I'm not going to use your fire and police and, I, and I'm not going to pay. Uh, that sounds fair, right? I'm not using your services, which you're trying to impose upon me. Well, it turns out that even then, no, you still have to pay your 8% tribute as a citizen of state X. So this is a very odd form of contract if we look at it that way. Some argue that democracy is what makes state authority justified. The people who appeal to democracy, um, usually they appear to have a simplistic view that like all of the laws are, that are passed are authorized by the people. So that, to begin with, is really questionable. Um, it's very possible to have laws that are not, um, not accepted by the majority of people. Uh, so obvious cases would be like in 2008 to 9, the, uh, the bailout of the big banks was very unpopular uh, among people, among both Democrats and Republicans. But you know, just the voters, not the politicians. It was popular among the politicians, and they passed it anyway. Um, and that's just an illustration of the fact that, you know, however you want to account for why this happens, uh, laws do get passed that most people don't support. Okay. Second thing to say is, who cares if most people support it, right? So, you know, the question is, um, if a larger number of people want to do something that would otherwise be morally wrong, does it become morally permissible because there's a larger number of people who support it than are against it? So generally not, right? Like there's no other case in which you would say that. So, you know, there's five people in the room, four of them want to beat up the fifth person. They decide to take a vote on whether beating up the fifth person is okay. Only one person opposes it. No, I'm against beating me up, <laughs> okay? And then, oh, so now the four people can beat up the five because there, there were more of them. It's a majority rule. Okay, so nobody thinks that that um, makes it okay to be of the person. Nobody thinks that that suspends the person's rights. And you can just go through any, like any other circumstance that doesn't involve the government. You wouldn't say an action that was initially wrong becomes okay if a majority of people support it. So as the great Tom Woods always says, it's my favorite analogy ever. Um, he said, well, imagine Walmart ran all the schools and uh, uh, you had to send your kids to a, a, an institution run by Walmart. And every morning they had to pledge allegiance to Walmart and you had pictures of all the Walmart CEOs all around the room and they would tell you all these fantastic, you know, tales of, well, the first Walmart CEO never told a lie, and you know, like all this, just the outright lies and propaganda. And then you had a society that was, um, you know, really favored Walmart. And you're like, why do you think they like Walmart so much? Uh, well, it's because they're being propagandized from the time they're children. And, you know, propaganda works. What the states keep out of history textbooks are the things that call into question the existence of the states themselves. That call into question the existence of our form of governance, that call into question the existence of a nation state to begin with, that call into existence, call into question the existence of borders, governments, police, prisons, anything that calls into question the existence of the system those schools belong to. State overreach is a perpetual threat to individual liberty. The state insists on scrutinizing the lives of its subjects, but resists reform, transparency, and accountability.
the individual actors in government are not bearing the costs, uh, the net costs of their actions. So if you want people to, to, if you want individual rationality to lead to group rationality, you need some mechanism such that when I take an action, I bear most of the net costs. I get the benefits or and pay the costs. And on the market, that's mostly true, though not perfectly true. Uh, ordinary private market, but on the political market, it's almost never true that if I vote for the bad candidate and he gets elected, uh, the costs of that are distributed around at least my country and maybe the world. Uh, if I'm a judge and I make a decision that sets a bad precedent, I'll never know that it was a bad precedent. Uh, I'm imagining a precedent which changes the legal system just a little bit and a very small change in the legal system might produce costs of say $100 million a year huge amount of damage for one person to, to make. Commerce Clause, for example, which gives Congress only the power to regulate interstate commerce, and which to Madison regulate meant to keep regular. Um, Marshall and his uh, colleagues and subsequent courts have interpreted to allow Congress to do nearly anything it wants. The, the color of your shirt, the thickness of the soles on your shoes, the pigment on the paint, the brightness of the lights, the curvature of the lens, all these things are absurdly regulated uh, by the feds. So I think there's really two reasons why businesses uh, feel the need to lobby and interact with the state. So one, they want to get privileges over their competitors and they want to try and get some sort of subsidies, tariffs, restrictions, monopolistic grants of privileges that can give them an edge over their, uh, their competitors so they act as political entrepreneurs. Uh, the other uh, tendency is that their competitors are also doing the exact same thing, as well as other interest groups, so various ideologues, reformers, socialists, unions, etc., and they feel the need to basically block hostile regulation that's uh, coming in threatening. So in other words, they have to play both the offense and the defense. So they're in the political arena to secure benefits and shape regulation to their advantage. I remember one um, time that a cop said to a friend of mine, he, he called a friend of mine, we were 14, and he said, he said he smelled weed. And we actually weren't smoking weed. And I, you know, he could have easily caught us like an hour later and we probably would have been, but we weren't smoking weed. And my friend was really scared and he got in his face and put a flashlight right in his face. And he said, are you scared? I wanna watch you piss your pants in front of me. To a 14 year old child. If a police officer stops you, you don't have, even if you know that you're innocent, you don't have the freedom to tell them, no, I don't want to deal with you. No, they have a monopoly on force. They can initiate force, initiate violence up to and including killing you if you do not abide by what they have to say. A pretty close state to absolute power. Uh, in the dynamic of a cop, particularly a cop with a teenager, but in general a cop, I mean, what, you know, what, you know, like even things will be like, well, I didn't consent to that search. Well, what happens if a cop says in court you did? It's your word against the cops. Who are they going to side with? They side with the cop every time. So there's two dynamics. There's one that power corrupts, um, and so you give people this power. None of us do well. International law is a legal system that is created without an overarching sovereign. In a sense, it mimics anarchist law. It's a bunch of different states, and they interact with each other in an environment where there isn't a higher power that hands down what the rules are of the game and how everyone shall behave. The international system is self-governed in, in the sense that all the states work together, at least ostensibly, as equals. So international law, I believe, can serve as a model for how we could imagine the possibility of a stateless order, because we do have 200 citizens of the world which don't have an overarching uh, super sovereign. So it's possible to have peace among actors that are decentralized and that are sovereign with respect to themselves and don't have an overlord that forces them um, to comply with some kind of set of rules. So the Hob Hob Hobbesian idea that you can have order among individuals without a government to tell them what to do is sort of disproved by the existence of the international order and international law. The question is, how would we apply that then down to a lower and lower level? And the key issue would be just to add, to keep adding more and more choice among 
uh, people actually living in these places in terms of different legal systems that they can choose from, different societies, and so on. Anarchism can be difficult to define. In spite of often being incorrectly used to mean chaos, the word actually comes from the Greek word anarchia, meaning without a ruler. The earliest traces of anarchist thought date back to ancient Greece and China, where many philosophers questioned the legitimacy of the state. Taoist sages like Su and Zhang Zhao developed a non-rule type of philosophy that would eschew any type of political involvement. Ancient Greece also gave rise to some early anarchist thought. In 300 BC, Zeno of Citium founded Stoicism, heavily influenced by the Cynics. His Republic advocates for removing all state structures. Gerard Winstanley, who was part of the Diggers movement during the English Civil War, would become the foremost prominent proponent of Christian anarchism. He published a pamphlet in which he drew upon the Bible, claiming that the blessings on earth should be common to all and that none lord over others. He argued for communal ownership. In 1703, Louis Armand, Baron de la Toen, used the word anarchy in his new voyages in North America to describe the peaceful indigenous people as having no state and no prisons. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, especially in his Discourse on Inequality, had a strong impact on anarchism. He argued that due to man's good nature, state was oppressive. In 1793, William Godwin would write one of the first anarchist texts inquiring concerning political justice. Around the end of the 18th century, Godwin was the first to use anarchism as the name of a philosophy which would ultimately be popularized by the end of the 19th century. Max Stirner, who wrote The Ego in Its Own, Stirner advocated for a more radical type of individualism. Stirner argued we are all egoists, doing everything for our own advantage. Stirner did not believe there were rights or transcendent morality, labeling such things as spooks created by the powerful to oppress. Left anarchism has a rich spectrum of ideas, bridging ecology, labor relations, social and sexual inequality. Authors like Murray Bookchin and Noam Chomsky were strongly associated with left anarchism, particularly anarcho-syndicalism. Emma Goldman was a prominent anarchist activist, once known as the most dangerous woman in America. She was born in what is now Lithuania and moved to the U.S. in 1885. She heavily influenced and lectured on anarchist philosophy, women's rights, and social issues of the day. She founded the anarchist journal Mother Earth in 1906. Voltairine de Cléry was an American anarchist and contemporary of Emma Goldman, who ultimately advocated for anarchism without adjectives, foregoing descriptions such as individualist, communist, mutualist, or collectivist. She was staunchly against the state and the existence of a standing army. Her contributions to anarchism and her lecture named Sex Slavery helped create the foundations of anarcho-feminism. Pierre-Joseph Proden published his What is Property in 1840, which would prove to become a highly influential book on anarchist thought. Proden argued property, as most people understand it, is theft. That being said, he also argued that property that was a result of labor was legitimate, but property of unused land or that profits from rent or interest was illegitimate. Proden argued, to be governed is to be watched, inspected, spied on, directed, law-driven, numbered, regulated, enrolled, indoctrinated, preached at, controlled, checked, estimated, valued, censured, commanded by creatures who have neither the right nor the wisdom nor the virtue to do so. His philosophy, which has influenced anarchist thought across the spectrum, was called mutualism. There was also Mikhail Bakunin. Bakunin argued that freedom and equality were inseparable. Bakunin said in The Political Philosophy of Bakunin, Scientific Anarchism, we are convinced that freedom without socialism is privilege and injustice, and that socialism without freedom is slavery and brutality. Bakunin's philosophy is called collectivist anarchism. At the end of the 19th century came Peter Kropotkin. Kropotkin wanted to synthesize communism and anarchism, creating anarcho-communism. Kropotkin argued with those who sought to use Darwin's new theory of evolution to justify racial and class inequality. Kropotkin argued that mutual aid, rather than the, the dominant gene in a species, that the defining feature of evolution was actually mutual aid. 
Kropotkin also wrote, wrote The Conquest of Bread. This book was hugely influential on anarchists in Catalonia as well as in the modern day Rojava. This created a divide in the 19th century between anarchists who were communists and those who were not. Mutualists believed in individual property rights, but with equal access to lands sans taxation, sans taxation and sans profit. Anarcho-communists, on the other hand, believed the community rather than the individual should be in control of property, removing all market transactions, and would adopt the Marxist principle of from each according to his ability to each according to his need. There were also anarchists in America who were influenced by both Proden's mutualism as well as by classical liberalism. Josiah Ward, who put his theories to the test with a labor for labor store, Cincinnati Time Store, in which trade notes were issued backed by the promise of labor. This was the first store to function this way and actually proved quite successful before Warden's decided to close shop in order to pursue colonies based on his understanding of mutualism. Warren's settlement, Modern Times, whose name would later be changed to Brentwood, had no government, no clearly defined laws, and no money, yet absolutely no crime and very little commotion. Another American anarchist, Benjamin Tucker, said of Warren that he was the first man to expound and formulate the doctrine now known as anarchism. Speaking of Benjamin Tucker, he was another anarchist who described himself as an unterrified Jeffersonian. Tucker's focus was on his fear of central planning, fearing that it may have destroyed any hope for either anarchy or central planning. A more controversial claim of Tucker's, echoed only by anarchists hostile to communism, was anarchism is a word without meaning, unless it includes the liberty of the individual to control his product or whatever his product has brought him through the exchange in a free market, that is, private property. Whoever denies private property is of necessity an archist. Gustave de Molinari wrote The Production of Security in 1849. Murray Rothbard would consider him to be the great innovator in the market provision of security. Then we have Lysander Spooner, who is influential to both left-leaning anarchists as well as anarcho-capitalists. Lysander Spooner was an abolitionist and a constitutional lawyer. In, in 1845, he wrote The Unconstitutionality of Slavery. Spooner used both legal and natural law arguments to prove the Constitution, in fact, did not support slavery. He acknowledged the Founding Fathers of America probably did not intend to end slavery, but only the meaning of the text and not the individual intentions of its authors were enforceable. He later pamphlets on jury nullification as well as legal advice for escaped slaves and gave legal services to fugitives. The debate between communist anarchists and non-communists would become so hotly contested that some make the case it may be why some anarchists, anarcho-capitalists, reject socialism altogether, often to incorporate classic liberal ideals such as homesteading, moving away from socialism, and towards an anarchist form of classical liberalism. Anarcho-capitalism is a school of anarchism that advocates individual autonomy and private property. What happened was that over the last several centuries, starting in the 17th and going up to the 18th and 19th century, we had a, a march, an upward march, not, not of course a, a, every day, but basically an upward march of, of, of freedom. <clears throat> and uh, the death of the old order, which was statism and serfdom and slavery and uh, theocracy. <clears throat> and uh, rising up from this, from this muck, was the idea of individual freedom and the institutions of individual freedom. Personal freedom, religious freedom, political freedom, economic freedom, free market. He had a really uh, comprehensive knowledge, not just of economics, but of political theory, philosophy, and many other subjects. And he had a tremendous intellectual curiosity about all things. He was, he was constantly coming up with new ideas and he was very enthusiastic about the new ideas he found. First is the non-aggression principle, NAP. Um, keep your mitts to yourself and don't grab other people with their property without their permission. Now uh, in boxing, if you and I are in a boxing match and uh, you punch me in the nose, I can't say, oh, assault and battery, because I've agreed to be hit above the belt. The second one would be private property rights. And we need private property rights because suppose you grab this shirt that I'm now wearing. Did you uh, violate the non-aggression principle? Well, it all depends upon who, own, who owns this shirt. If um, I stole it from you yesterday, you're just repossessing your property and I'm the bad guy. On the other hand, it's my shirt, keep your mitts off, and if you grab it, you're the bad guy. So we have to know who is the owner of my shirt. <laughs> 
And the third one is free association. No one should be forced or compelled to associate with anyone against his will. One of the direct effects of the non-aggression principle, the NAP, NAP, is no government. That would be the purest libertarian view. Why? Because government taxes people against their will. And we just got finished saying that the non-aggression principle says that you shouldn't be uh, forced to do anything. You should be able to do anything you damn well please, except keep your mitts off of other people. Well, when they're taxing us, that violates the non-aggression principle and it violates free association. They're making us associate with them. And where do we get that from? Uh, I didn't sign the Constitution. The idea that uh, rights are simple and clear and therefore you can uh, eliminate everything by, uh, you can solve all problems by showing you can't do that because it violates rights. Uh, and some of those, I guess my favorite uh, counter to that uh, which comes from Bill Bradford, who was the editor of Liberty Magazine. He's no longer alive, unfortunately, but he was an interesting guy. Uh, and he says, all right, you, this is my memory of his example. Uh, you happen to be on, you fall off your balcony on the 15th floor of an apartment building, unfortunately. But fortunately, there's a flagpole uh, coming off the balcony on the 14th floor, just below you, and you manage to grab hold of that doesn't break and you're going hand over hand back to the 14th floor balcony to get on it and get down. When the owner of that apartment comes uh, out of his, comes onto his balcony and he says, that flagpole is my property, not yours, let go. Do you? Well, if the answer is that you don't, we have to either say that's because you're a bad person, you've just violated his rights, or you have to say uh, it is morally legitimate to violate rights when enough is at stake, which is basically what this comes to. But once you've conceded that it's morally right to, to violate rights when enough is at stake, now you've abandoned the moral argument against almost everything. I know lots of people have different visions of what this looks like, um, but let's say we're talking about an extremely decentralized covenant community where uh, people just come together and form communities where they, they sign a contract and I agree to live in this place and follow these rules. And uh, as I argue in some of my essays, this is probably the likely way that most people would live. A lot of people imagine that, oh, well, I'll, I'll just go out and do my own thing out in the countryside and no one will bother me. This, of course, is an extremely naive way of looking at things is that uh, your neighbors would probably just come and try and take your stuff away. So m most people would, would congregate into a group of some kind and then agree to give up certain amount, certain, certain per prerogatives in order to amass their resources and put together a private security force and so on. I think when it comes to the most widely understood cases of unjustified aggression, there is a pretty broad uh, range of agreement. I mean. Yeah, not everybody thinks taxation is theft, but virtually everybody thinks murder can't be justified. Virtually everybody thinks you can't break into somebody's house and take his things. And that's the baseline we operate from. And if there are a handful of people who don't accept that, well, that's what we have self-defense for. I think it's, it's just a numbers game. Like, it's just how many people believe in the, the moral legitimacy of the ruling class because people say, well, well, how do we end this and how, how do we end that? And, you know, there are people using cryptos to undermine the extortion racket, which is awesome. There are people who are big on Second Amendment rights and like, we need guns, so we have the right to, you know, so we have the ability to forcibly defend if they do this, which I'm fine with that too. But to me, it's a numbers game. Like, if there's only a few of us, you know, we're doomed. You can run off and hide in a cabin in the woods or something and you might get away with that. But I want to see the whole world become free and rational and moral. Agorism is the school of anarchist thought developed by Samuel Edward Konkin III. Konkin advocated for peaceful counter-economics with the intent to starve the state of funding. Sam and Neil were driving across country, actually. They were at college in New York, and they were driving across country, and uh, they worked out the details of agorism. And uh, Neil put it into his book, um, A Long Side Night. If I recall correctly, Sam was supposed to have a book come out, but he couldn't find the publisher. So Neil, who, uh, you know, he's friends with Heinlein and a lot of different authors, he was a little bit more established in the writing scene. He, he put out A Long Side Night, 
And that was really the foundational text of agorism. It, the main thing is just pretty much bleeding the state dry, staying out of the state in as any way possible, like not paying taxes, cash transactions and all that, but with the idea of doing it to stay away from government. The white market, which is uh, obviously the acceptable market, you know, everybody trades in that, you know, taxes, regulations. Then there's the gray markets, uh, which is, you know, you, you're, it's a legal business, but it's, it, you're, maybe you're not paying taxes, you know, you're a tax evader or whatever, and you know, you're not claiming everything or it's not regulated. Carl Hess was one of the early agorists. He used to be a Republican. He worked for Barry Goldwater and he coined the term or the phrase, extremism in defense of liberty is no vice. And eventually he became more and more uh, of an anarchist. And he got in with Sam Conkin and all those guys. And he wrote uh, Community Technology, which is a little, I hesitate to call it a book because it's so small. It's really just a booklet where he describes his whole experience in the Adams Morgan neighborhood in Washington, D.C., where he creates um, this whole farm in an urban environment. And what's really striking to me is that if you can do that in Washington, D.C., you can do that anywhere. Nobody is capable by revolutionary action of overturning great social systems. It has never been done. There hasn't been a revolution uh, by armed force ever in the history of the world. What it, we have had is changes of management very often, but no revolution. Crypto anarchy. So the idea is essentially that the use of cryptography will help us uh, subvert or undermine the state. And I think that's um, absolutely huge to where we are in the future, not just in terms of blockchains, but also like we said, in terms of Tor as well. So when we combine the two, uh, again, we have things like the Silk Road where you can buy and sell at will whatever you want to whomever you want without any form of regulation or censorship by Congress or your governor, or your state legislature. Crypto anarchy is, uh, that is to me what's going to save us. And I think the crypto anarchists have become essentially a wing of the agorist uh, movement. Anarchy is just normal life that happens all around us every day. Um, when we walk down the street, uh, we all have a vested interest in just having society where we deal with one another peaceably and we deal with one another in ways that we feel are justified and win-win. I mean, anarchy is just, is just in the air around us. It's not uh, something abstract. It's just human beings doing what they want to do voluntarily, uh, without force, without coercion. We can distinguish between uh, individualist anarchism, which is based on private property ownership, and other types of anarchism that are more of a communitarian kind that don't recognize private property. I think that by anarchist societies, uh, and by anarchism in general, um, compared to its popular use as chaos, disorder, violence, and so on, um, the anarchism ought to be understood as forms of cooperation and mutuality without hierarchy. I think the developers would develop towns and cities uh, and people that were lived in towns already and so on, um, those would, would, would be um, uh, the, the public areas, let's say, would would would, would then be owned as as uh, almost as stockholders. People in the town would be stockholders in those public areas. But I think you could have any number of organizations where people come together and form um, a variety of communal organizations, own communal property, have communally owned towns and cities, and so on. Those could all certainly meet the the definition. Uh, the, I think the key component there is that you would have a lot of choice about where you would live. In 1860, Paul Emile Dupuit coined the term panarchy, which is a system that recognizes the individual's right to choose any form of government without being forced to move from their current locale. Panarchy to me is one of the next stages of human social evolution. Instead of 
pure anarchy, okay? Which sometimes um, you, you might think of anarchy, or some people might think of anarchy as just being utopian, being fanciful. Um, panarchy is a way of describing arrangements where we don't make any sort of judgments about the kinds of civil association that people want to enter into, but they do that rather freely. And what's interesting about panarchy is it's different from polycentrism, which is another fancy P word that just means we're breaking up power into smaller jurisdictions and allowing for people to vote with their feet. If they don't like this jurisdiction, they can go to the other one. Polycentrism is this idea, and it's really important. You can join your Republican or Democrat or Socialist or what have you association and in your home. So in, instead of adjoining a party that fights over who gets to control 350 million people, say, a, a panarchic state of affairs would just be if you believe in joining a kibbutz or you believe in the Singaporean healthcare system or if you believe in some other set of governance arrangements, be they hierarchical or decentralized, you can join those and you can exit them if they're not working out for you. You get a market and governance that is divorced from territory. We have to ask ourselves now in this day and age, why is it that rules have to be attached to territory always and in every case? They don't need to be. And in fact, for most things, the rules we live under are an artifact of conquest, or an artifact of, you know, I was born on, on this patch of soil that long time ago was conquered by somebody who makes the rules on my behalf. It doesn't have to be this way. But the panarchist says, let's try different experiments and let's see who joins what civil associations and then we can just have uh, mechanisms for settling disagreements between those civil associations. Whether or not anarchists should utilize politics to try to shrink the state is a hotly debated topic. Recently, on the federal level, we got a, a right to try bill, which says that if you are suffering from a terminal disease and there's some experimental drug that you might be able to take, we're going to give you the option to take it. But that began as on the state level, as a series of states began introducing uh, right to try laws. Now, there's no authorization for a right to try law on the national level. They were just doing it. And as it turns out, they paved the way for a liberation that occurred on the national level. And you can go down the 10th Amendment Center. If you, you can go down the list of the various initiatives they have, and you'll see how many of them there are on such a wide array of issues that might appeal to both left and right. If I look through the history of so-called states' rights, in the first, let's say, 150 years of American history, what do I find it being used for? Well, I find it being used to defend the freedom of speech, uh, to defend against unconstitutional searches and seizures, to defend against a military draft during the War of 1812 that was proposed that some people like Congressman and then Senator Daniel Webster thought was unconstitutional. But in fact, they were even used to fight against slavery. And we see that not only in the personal liberty laws, which were used to fight against the fugitive slave laws that um, existed in the 19th century, um, we have states, for example, refusing to allow the federal government to use its facilities, to use its, its jails to hold uh, suspects, or uh, to let any state official uh, take part in running after a fugitive slave or anything like that. The whole thing is, is uh, the, the, the principle of secession, I think, is very, very good. Uh, I, I sort of lean toward the nonviolent uh, approach, but I always support, uh, support uh, secession. And I think that the founders made a mistake by not having that in the Constitution, because that would have restrained the government if we could have, as individual states, leave the United States uh, anytime we want. They would have been much more reserved in the abuse of the rights that the states should have and the rights of the individuals within the states. Secession is an approach you take when you have irreconcilable differences. That's, in effect, what happens. Right now in the United States, we have well over 300 million people, and we are divided right down the middle in how we look at the world. We have radically different worldviews. And instead of saying, why don't we work on an arrangement where people who think one way can just live according to those ideas, and people who think another way can live that way? Instead, we feel like we have to win and triumph over our enemies. 
well, there has to be one way to think that dominates the entire country. And at some point you should ask yourself, is that really the most civilized way for us to organize society? Is that the most civilized way for human beings to live with each other? And I'm inclined to think that it would be better if we said, look, we, we just don't have the same vision for what society ought to be. And instead of every four years having a low intensity civil war with each other to see who's gonna ram ideas down the throats of the others, what if we say, well, why don't you live your way and we'll live our way and we'll see, you know, let the, let the best man win kind of thing. I think the idea that, oh, people just keep voting for someone who's better than the last clown that was in there, or that, you know, we just gotta wait for the Republican or Democrat systems to reform themselves and offer us some new candidates, that clearly isn't working. People have been trying that for a really long time now. And so I think if you're disgusted by the current system and you agree the current system is crazy, the very least you can do is stop legitimizing it by voting every two or four years because that's really the, the fig leaf that they hide behind is to say, oh, well, this system is voluntary in a sense because look at these leaders were democratically elected. So I would just say I, I, I do believe most of the victories you're likely to have are going to come at your local level. You have no chance of influencing the U.S. Senate to do anything. But on your local level, well, you could, you know, you might even know your local state legislator. I mean, he might actually live on your street. There is a possibility that you could get some tax repealed or some onerous regulation repealed. The next level of libertarianism below that would be minarchism. Ayn Rand, Robert Nozick, and there they support the non-aggression principle, but they allow government, very minimal government, to have armies, courts, and police. Armies not to export democracy, but to just make sure bad guys don't come from abroad and attack us. Police not to um, uh, uh, make people virtuous, but to just make sure that murderers and rapists don't do their thing and, and leave victimless criminals alone, like prostitution and drugs. Everybody's a minarchist you know, who's not an anarchist. Joseph Stalin was a minarchist. Bernie Sanders is a minarchist. If you're just going to say, well, I think the state should do X, Y, Z, well, why not X, Y, Z and A, B, C? And while we're at it, E, F, G and a whole bunch of other things. I mean, either you're, you're guided by first principles or you're not, and you're just in the realm of preferences. And, you know, anarchists get accused of being utopian, but there is nothing more utopian than a minarchist. Uh, the idea that a state will stay restrained because it just decides it doesn't want more power. We're gonna create a monopoly on the initiation of violence, and they'll probably decide we'll only stay, you know, a certain reasonable size. Well, I mean, how, how much empirical evidence do you need to disprove uh, the idea that that's even possible? And in fact, there's a pretty strong correlation between relatively small states becoming the biggest states. It's not a coincidence that the United States of America, which started as this experiment in restrained government, uh, with all these brilliant thinkers who wrote all about checks and balances and divisions of power, well, now it's the biggest state that's ever uh, existed in the history of humanity. The most effective strategy for bringing about a stateless society is not politics at all. I don't think we're going to send our prayers up in the voting booth and hope that the authorities grant us this kind of supreme freedom. Markets are the most common way for people to meet their needs. Many anarchist theories have offered market solutions for services that are often defined as public goods, such as law, defense, security, and education. The entrepreneur is sort of the fundamental agent who drives forward the market economy, right? Yeah. You know, look at all the goods and services that we have around us, the chairs we're sitting in, this building in which we're doing this recording, the equipment, the camera, and computers, and so forth that we're using. Where did all those things come from? They have to be produced by human beings, right, who exercise forethought and planning and have a deliberate purpose and use their ingenuity and so forth to come up with ways, you know, to convert the inputs that are given by nature natural resources and land and, and, and energy and, and human labor and so forth, those have to be converted or transformed into iPhones and buildings and automobiles and food that we can eat and so forth. So the entrepreneurial function is this taking command of resources and making them into stuff that you can try to offer to consumers in the future, not knowing for sure whether you'll be successful or not. If you are successful, 
If you're good at anticipating future conditions, you can produce a thing that consumers will want and will pay more than what it costs you, right, to, to make the thing, and you earn a profit. If you're unsuccessful, you earn a loss. It's this constant pursuit of profit and desire to avoid loss that animates the process of production and makes all this stuff around us available. As Ludwig von Mises said, it is impossible to picture a market economy or to have a picture of a market economy without the entrepreneur. This agent, this agency, constantly pushing and promoting and moving the economy forward. Technology is a good example of that, where companies are having to hire all sorts of specialized labor to interact with one another to try to come up with improvements in the product or improvements in production. Um, and so that's, that's the order that anarchy brings uh, because it is all based on voluntary activities that are meant to be efficient and meant to be productive and meant to be mutually beneficial. That's what's really ironic about that perennial question of who will build the roads is in the current system, it's not usually that it's literal employees of the state who are building roads, it's just the state has contracts and they farm it out to various bidders. As it is now, poor people pay for the roads even though they never use them or never go anywhere. Uh, but people who are maybe higher income and travel a lot around the metro area or travel up to tourist spots and so on, they're using those roads more. If you told, if you turn those into toll roads, they'd have to pay more, and then they would be annoyed by that. Whereas right now, you're uh, you're charging grandma to pay for that road that she never ever uses because she's like a shut-in, and so that evens out the cost then for people. On the I-10, which is a big highway that goes past New Orleans, yeah. all the way from Florida to California, um, the minimum speed is 40 and the maximum speed is 70. Well, maybe it would be better if the speed in this lane was 50 and 65 and 80. Would that reduce that? I don't know. All I know is if different people try different things. Now, on your road, you're going to make it um, uh, 60, uh, 70 and 80, and on someone else's road it's going to be 65, 70, and 75, maximum speed. Well, which, uh, which of those is better? I don't know. I think that um, just as Ben Franklin set up a private, a private uh, firefighting service, um, there's no reason at all that all the fire departments, which also engage in a form of protection, uh, need to be government. Private education solutions include private schools, tutoring, homeschooling, and unschooling. We have the idea that, well, every, you know, every child deserves an education. It's impossible to imagine the market providing that level of education. Therefore, it needs to be provided by local, state, national government, etc. Education is a special kind of a good. People will say, well, maybe the market can produce toothpaste in appropriate quantities and qualities, but not education. Education is a different kind of a thing. It's a so-called public good, can't be provided by the market, must be provided by the state, and we have to require that every student get this education. Uh, and that's why we have compulsory attendance laws. Okay, look, I'm a professional educator. Do I think education in the abstract is important? You bet I do. But education is not a thing Right? There's not just one homogeneous blob of education where everybody gets one unit of education or, or no education, right? Education is just like any other good or service on the market, right? We don't actually consume education, something in the abstract, but we, we read books, we attend classes, we, and as adults, right, we, we, you can hire a consultant to educate you on something. You can watch a documentary film like this one and educate yourself. Uh, you can read a book, you can talk to somebody, you can participate in a discussion group, you can go online, right? There are all kinds of ways that we get educated, but the things we consume are specific, discrete, marginal units of a thing that I read or a lecture that I heard or, or whatever. And you know, are those things bought and sold in markets? Yeah, ask uh, Amazon.com or any, you know, or Hollywood or um, a college or university, a for-profit college or university or school. Of course, people buy educational goods and services all the time. The current government uh, educational system 
uh, emphasizes a general curriculum where everybody learns the same thing. So you have survey courses in college on Western civilization, right? Everybody learns the same thing and you're told what to think about it. And also conveniently studying the course of Western civilization, which is important, uh, but you're told what to think and you are not told about the key factors of the rise of Western civilization, which is private property, free markets, and sound money. Those, you know, if you've, if you've taken those classes, I, I took a couple when I was in college, Western Civ One and Western Civ Two, and uh, inflation was mentioned once, even though it's the thing that brings down civilizations time after time. And so getting back to that, I think, you know, people would be exposed to great ideas. They would appreciate great ideas and they would think for themselves. Private alternatives for criminal justice are gaining popularity due to the inefficiency and unreliability of state courts and police. Private dispute resolution is a multi-billion dollar industry and much of the security in society is already produced privately in the form of security firms, neighborhood watch groups, and private gun ownership. Courts can be private. We see that every day in, in uh, private adjudication systems, uh, in the arbitration systems. Uh, police, we see that every day in the form of security, uh, private security at places like Disneyland. And as far as national defense goes, I think it's largely a myth. I don't think that the rest of the world is particularly looking to uh, come invade America. And uh, e even if it was, I think that uh, the, the notion that security could be provided uh, on the marketplace is, is something that's absolutely tenable and that, that we need to look at. Well, I think there would be lawyers even in a free society. I think there would still be uh, conflicts. I think there would still be contracts that would occasionally be breached. I think there would still be disputes between neighbors, disputes amongst in, in business. I think there's a, there's a lot of ways in which lawyers would still be a thing in a, in a private society and might still have a market function in drafting contracts and representing people in what we would hope would be some form of common law courts or private courts or private arbitration. Well, for normal sort of police services, I think the way people would think of it nowadays just with private agencies um, fulfilling those services and notice the big difference here is there would be competition so right now if just imagine a grocery store they hired an agency to crack down on shoplifting some kid puts a stake under his uh you know under his coat pocket and he, he starts running out the door and the agency goes and tackles him and breaks his legs or shoots him cold dead that would be bad for business. That particular agency would go out of business and so over time you would see um, police, what we think of as the job of the police, would be handled by competing private firms in a very uh, efficient but also humane manner. You didn't have prisons, for example, in um, earlier societies which were much less, much less um, state-oriented than, than the ones today. I mean, prisons are a relatively recent development uh, Britain, I think, was the first to have them in the, uh, in the 18th century. The idea of private defense services was first suggested by Gustav de Molinari in his 1849 essay, The Production of Security. When we think about the private provision of military defense, it's important to always use an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. So it's true that a relatively small city, no matter what they did, wouldn't be able to repel Nazi Germany, for example, but by the same token, neither did France. And France used a conventional state military to defend itself and it lost. So the, the claim from the anarchist camp is always that for a given group of people, other things equal, they will be able to better defend themselves if their defense is left to voluntary market provision than if the government monopolizes and tries to take over that um, enterprise. So as far as a city of 25,000 people defending themselves, we don't know exactly what they would do, but the point is any money they spent on missile defense or other types of defense would be better spent because we can see governments notoriously spend way too much on you know, military procurement. The, the amount they spend for a given missile or, or uh, bullets or whatnot is, is more than the private sector analog would be. So for a given amount of expenditure, a smaller society of truly free people would get more bang for their buck, as it were. Also, the issue is they wouldn't be an offensive threat to anybody. 
so there would be no reason for a state to want to invade them except perhaps for the ideological one that it's awkward that there's this free society that's prospering but in terms of why is it that governments largely go to war with each other just like switzerland for example was able to go through both world wars relatively unscathed and that's partly because everybody knows they're not a threat to us the problem with the state provision of military defense among other issues is that it limits the brainstorming to just a few people who are in the military hierarchy and maybe some of the political uh, figures involved as well. And whereas a genuine open market relies on the contributions and the insights of the whole community. And so when you have the state running your defense, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. And that was shown, for example, most famously with uh, uh, France and the Maginot Line, you know, during World War II, where that sort of system would not have it wouldn't have occurred like that under private provision whereas yeah one company thought oh well, let's just really have these strong fortifications but some other company might say that's not a good idea let's try you know having these other systems to repel invaders and so that's really the the benefit of having competition when it comes to military defense is that's the last place in the world you want to have one agency with one plan and if the plan doesn't work then your country gets taken over Entrepreneurial innovation has done more to diminish state power than most political action. Number one, 3D printers, right? Um, CNC millers, ghost gunners. These are great, great options for people who want to uh, be able to defend themselves but not have to register with the state or go onto a government list. Um, that's one of my favorites. Um, also, cryptocurrency miners, right? Just if you're mining for Bitcoin, you're engaging in counter-economics because you're helping people avoid uh, the banking cartel. Also, Tor. Look at what um, Tor has done for people in providing uh, encryption uh, to protect them from the CIA and the NSA. So if you look at the market, uh, the underground market in Alongside Night, that is the Silk Road. That is what gave Ross the inspiration to create the first truly free and uncensored market. That's also why the state gave him double life plus 40. Anarchism is being spread into mainstream culture in music, comic books, animations, stand-up comedy, film, and video games. There's this really interesting thing that happened also like with Hollywood. I noticed, you know, John Hughes, very famous director, did a bunch of famous movies in the 1980s when I was coming of age. Um, what was it? Sixteen Candles and um, Breakfast Club. Movies like that that were really popular with sort of Gen Xers like me. And those movies, I think, invariably poked fun at principals and teachers in schools as sort of these lame authoritarian figures, right? Who the heroes of the movie would sort of, the whole movie would be about them sort of escaping. Like Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right? It's a classic example of that, right? Comic book creator Jack Lloyd discovered that crowdfunding and on-demand publishing was a recipe for successfully delivering entertainment and a principled message to audiences. When I was finishing up law school, I was kind of just killing some time thinking about what I'd like to do as relates to my passions, which involved, of course, the comic book world and also, you know, promoting liberty. I started to write it and put it together and format it and then think about what I could do for a pitch. And then I uh, worked with an artist to create the initial sketches and I put that together for a presentation on Indiegogo. And from there, you know, Voluntarius kind of took off. I'm also working with a lot of multimedia organizations to produce a lot of good libertarian content, and I'm quite interested in producing a video game. Um, this has been a fascinating thing for me lately. Somebody made a meme where they said, like, you know, Fortnite gets 400,000 people to play it every day or something, and, and the Libertarian Party gets so few votes, and I was like, it's a great point. Why do we not communicate our philosophy through more modern, enjoyable means? Why can't we sell it through entertainment? Some people would want to do, you know, not everybody's down for a dry philosophical discussion. Not everybody's down to argue economics like we are, but everybody likes video games, dude. Libertarian ideas are being brought to a wide audience by artists like Thomas Kay. Kay earned acclaim for his animation, George Ought to Help. You want to help Oliver out, so you give him some money. To your surprise, George 
doesn't offer Oliver any help. You try to persuade him, but it's no use. Imagining yourself in this situation, do you think it's okay to threaten to use physical force against George to get him to do the right thing? Now imagine a slightly different situation. This time, a group of your friends take a vote. Six out of 10 are in favor of threatening George to get him to help Oliver. Does this democratic process make it okay to threaten George? In 2017, Backwards, a new metal band, released Veracity, filled with anarchist-themed lyrics. The album spent many weeks on Billboard's metal album chart, peaking at number 20. From the willfully ignorant, the knowledge you won't get none, but don't get it twisted, I too was dumb and then some. Support a politician, sit back in that Twitter, get stars not understanding that you got That was our first album, Veracity, um, and it was it was a hit. I would have never imagined that it would have got big as it did. But now we're going to be a lot more. Our, you know, we ha we all come from different backgrounds, and we want to make sure we express that. So we've already pretty much announced that it will be sort of this like double sided type of type of deal. We had 18 tracks on the first album. This upcoming album is going to have one roughly like 20 and stuff like that. So we're going to, between our first two albums, I'll put out, we're going to put out more music than, you know, people that have three albums out, you know, three, four albums. But uh, this time we're trying to just get a little more, you know, just, just mix it up a little bit. Um, and I, I love it. I love the process and also obviously with us being able to talk about whatever we talk about because we don't have any strings attached to us, right? It, it, it's a lovely thing. There's a lot of closet, definitely in metalcore, even though it seems to be a lot, a really leftist dominated sort of subgenre. There's a lot of closeted libertarians in it because they're like, well, if I, if I come out and say some of that, man, that's basically the end of their career. And this is why I think they're so attracted to, to, to us and why, you know, I talk about it all the time, about the void that we just simply feel um, and, and just being oh, us. And people come up to us like, man, you make music that I enjoy, but man, you adopt a philosophy that I adopt, and that's what takes it to another level. And again, there's people in these bands that are kind of closeted, but again, it's like they don't think that it's worth putting themselves out there like that, just simply because, yeah, you get a target on your back. You get a target on your back because it's against the norm in the industry. Stand-up comic Dave Smith brought his comedy to podcasting in 2012, eventually hosting his popular podcast, Part of the Problem. He then made the jump from stage to screen as a regular on cable news shows and in his own comedy special, Libertas, which spent three weeks at the number one spot on iTunes. They went on, why do they hate us? That's how clueless we were. We didn't even know there was a beef. Like, if, if you had asked us on September 10th, you were like, oh, what do Muslims think about America? You'd be like, that we're awesome? I don't know, like, what else would they think? And then September 11th happened and we were like, whoa! Like, why do they hate us? And then people were like, well, you know, you've been bombing the shit out of them for decades. And we were like, what? Um, I'm obsessed with libertarianism. And so when I'm doing comedy, it just kind of comes out. And having the perspective of being an anarcho-capitalist, it gives me a different angle than just about any other comedian has on the topic of politics or government or even culture. Um, and there's just a lot of golden material there. Uh, there's nothing that, that's more absurd and hilarious than the idea of the state. And it's something that everybody accepts, and that's like comedy gold. Anarchists utilize podcasting and memes to spread messages further, bypassing corporate media. I was trying to figure out a way that I could contribute to the liberty movement. So I just decided to podcast. I. I had been in music at one point and I understood recording, so I bought some very basic equipment and I laid out about 15 episodes of my basics of volunteerism and libertarianism and just started. I never learned about guns, so I cover guns a lot in my in my channel and the content that I do. Now I, I love firearms and I love learning about it more, but growing up, it was something that uh, I never had 
experience in terms of culture or anyone in my family or anyone around me. One of the biggest things that we're, we're doing next uh, in this partnership together is we're focusing on dispelling a lot of the myths that are being perpetuated um, in the media against gun owners specifically. I was making memes for all different types of groups and, and pages uh, on my, of my own accord because I just had some technical skill in Photoshop and uh, you know just you know like entertaining people. But it really started to take off when I was invited to join the Anarchy Ball team uh, back in uh, 2013. Memes reach anybody and everybody. You see memes are obviously popular with younger people, but even older people, boomer memes, you know, <laughs> they're getting into it too. And it's just a seed. It's, they're little seeds that float all over the place and uh, they just spike right into people's minds. And even if it's something that they disagree with in the meme, because, you know, usually memes are pretty extreme with the idea that they're trying to get across and it bothers people or people really resonate with it but it sticks in their head and that's what i like a lot that and it's funny throughout history there have always been populations that live outside the reach of states in southeast asia millions thrive without a state to manage their lives james c scott discussed these anarchist communities extensively in his book the art of not being governed i'm a southeast asianist and I was interested in the history of the relationships between hill people in Southeast Asia and lowland people. And the states exist in the lowlands. And historically, one thought that the people in the hills were, in a sense, the ancestors of the people who founded states, that they were the backward, uh, less advanced, uh, had not discovered wet rice agriculture and Buddhism and so on. Um, and it turns out that it's a much more complicated and much more interesting story than that, that the, and here we're talking about an area of maybe 100 million people uh, spread all the way from the northern boundaries of Vietnam in the hills through, through Thailand, Laos, Burma, all, all into northeast India. And I contend, and I think the evidence is um, indisputable at this point, that historically, most of the hills were populated by people who were not always there, but ran away from states in the valleys uh, because of taxes, because of epidemics, because of wars, conscription, and so on. And, uh, and there, they were, if you like, fleeing states and therefore, um, uh, and they did, one, one of the things that they did was to create social structures that prevented states from arising among them. It's not that they didn't have order, it's not that they didn't have chiefs, um, but they had a whole system of preventing state formations. In Chiran, Mexico, citizens abolished all political parties and disbanded the police. It's a very great, very, very chill environment right now. And if you compare it to something, to an event uh, in the United States or Western Europe, any place in the first world, well, there's little to no security at all. And even that could make you wonder, what if there's a smart, lost soul out there that would think of harming everyone in any way? And that is easy, that's not gonna happen because of one simple reason. You don't know who has a gun here. Ya hay un cambio por el, el movimiento que se hizo entre nosotros y, y la verdad pues es algo que nosotros mismos nos sorprendemos y nosotros mismos no nos explicamos. In 2014, the Mexican Supreme Court ruled their system of government as constitutional, effectively ending a four-year-long fight against political parties getting back into the community. It was a significant victory that validated their efforts to rebuild. To do so, it must build a thriving economy buoyed by lucrative exports and stable local businesses. Los retos que enfrentamos es este inculcar cosas nuevas a la comunidad a que que se desarrolle más la lo que es este pues se puede decir la mercadotecnia, ¿no? Uh, because, in fact, it's a place of virgin for business. 
Mutual aid is a practice that combines individualism with collectivism to meet the needs of working people. People in a locale pool resources to help each other when temporary help is needed. These are very old structures. Mutual aid societies have been with us since the time of the, the Masons, uh, the Elks, and all manner of other aid organizations where people came together, looked after each other throughout human history. And in fact, there were at one point one-third of the U.S. population at, at the peak of these arrangements was a member of a mutual aid society. So the fact that these disappeared uh, came, came about for a couple of reasons. The first was that the, the, the welfare state really was ascendant uh, in the 20th century. And these, these associations were crowded out. We could no, people could no longer afford to, to both pay taxes and be members of these organizations and hope to get benefits out of it. Instead, they became dependent on the centralized welfare state. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, one of the primary sources of healthcare and health insurance for the working poor in Britain, Australia, and the United States was the Fraternal Society. Fraternal societies, or friendly societies in Britain and Australia, were voluntary mutual aid associations. Over one quarter of all American adults were members of fraternal societies in 1920. Fraternal societies were particularly popular among blacks and immigrants. A fraternal society was a group of working class people who formed an association and paid monthly fees into the association's fund. Individual members would then be able to draw on the pooled resources in times of need. There were a great many societies to choose from. Their most commonly offered services were life insurance, disability insurance, and lodge practice. Lodge practice meant that the lodge would retain a doctor to provide medical care to its members. <laughs> members would pay a yearly fee and then call on the doctor's services as needed. If members were unhappy with the doctor, the contract might not be renewed. Most remarkable was the low cost at which these medical services were provided. At the turn of the century, an average worker's daily wage would pay for a year's worth of medical care much cheaper than on the regular market. Yet, licensed physicians competed vigorously for lodge contracts, perhaps because of the security they offered. This competition kept members' costs low. The response of the medical establishment, both in America and in Britain, was one of outrage. Many saw it as a blow to the dignity of the profession that trained physicians should be eagerly bidding for the chance to serve lower-class tradesmen. Such low fees, many doctors complained, were bankrupting the medical profession. Socially inferior people were setting physicians' fees. Voluntarism in Action, a philanthropic organization, raised over $250,000 in 2019 for hundreds of people in need. Food Not Bombs is a decentralized nonprofit organization that feeds the homeless. Food Not Bombs continues to expand their local outreach and service. Don't Comply is an open carry organization based in Texas. For nine years, they've hosted the annual Feed the Need Drive, where they issue food and blankets to the homeless. Based in Philadelphia, Black Guns Matter is a grassroots gun organization that teaches nonviolent conflict resolution and firearm safety. Um, I started Black Guns Matter because we saw a need that there was a, a serious deficiency in uh, Second Amendment information. Uh, firearm safety training and education, and just a general, you know, understanding that we run this, that we the people, especially in urban demographics. So I wanted Black Guns Matter to reflect that, to give people an understanding of that. Um, and then it kept snowballing, and we've gotten larger and larger, and more and more people are down with us. The leaders, whether they law enforcement, and when I say leader, I mean a woman or man that is uh, doing positive things for and with their and in the community. Um, whether they politicians or whether they clergymen and women or whether they, you know, uh, just guys, OGs, guys that did some time, they got some credibility. They love what we're doing. They, 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 they know what time it is. They, they, they know the race's roots of gun control. As the state expands, it's easy to forget that everything the state does coercively was once done voluntarily for ourselves and each other. If you're interested in individual liberty and personal freedom, I would say the most important thing 
is learning yourself, learning what you want. I think some people don't want freedom. Some people don't want personal liberty. Some people want to be told what to do. Some people want to be regimented. Some people want to be cogs in a machine or work in a cubicle for a boss or be a member of an army. And there's nothing we can do about that. Um, that's just their values, right? So you have to decide what your values are. What do you value in life? Do you value the freedom to move your body wherever you want to move it, however you want to move it? Do you value the freedom to say whatever you want to say, whenever you want to say it? You don't have to worry about having a, a huge number. You don't have to get 50 or 60% of the people to agree. You just need about 10% of the people who are energetic and are thought leaders and put the information out. I think once you convinced enough people that a free society would work, it would be preferable the current one, whatever particular mechanism is used to get there is just gonna be a whole lot easier, whether it's um, seasteading or secession. If you were to, to tell somebody in 1840 that we were gonna abolish slavery across the West in the next 25 years, it would have seemed crazy. People worried who would build, uh, who would pick the cotton, just like they worry today who will build the roads. But we can go to a much better place. We can actually be morally consistent. You don't have to live in this world where you you pick which criminal you think is going to be slightly better than the other one. We all know they're all criminals. We all know this. People don't like politicians. They don't. They, people know who they are. Yeah, everybody has these skills, the things that they're good at. Just go for it, like give it a shot. Definitely in the age of social media, you can be a content creator like it's tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like, just do it, just give it a shot. See what happens. If you fail, you, you, you don't do as, don't do that good, you, you, and you know, or you never know, you may, it may be a hit with, with a circle of people. Just go for it, give it a shot. At this part, I'm still young, I'm only you know, 28, but at, in the same respects, I, 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 if I'm like, hey man, this is something I feel like I could do, I'm just gonna go do it. And if it doesn't work out, it just doesn't work out. But that can apply to each and every single individual.